friends today i am discussing the multiple choice questions appeared in first mbbs examination of doctor in truhs of andhra pradesh these questions belong to paper 2 of first mbbs physiology held on 4th february 2022 the question paper i have chosen is set a because in each of these sets the question numbers may change including the the option options the answer options i have answered the questions with reference to gaitan or genong's textbook of physiology the international editions and i have mentioned them in the answer section i would request you to prescribe to this channel leave your comments for any information or additional discussion on any of the questions you are thinking about without wasting time we proceed to question number 1 of set a the question number 1 is about is myelinated nerve that is the stem the answer options are a axons have smaller diameter the b the nerve impulses travels uniformly along axolemma c density of voltage gated sodium channels are more d sodium channels are less in axons the question as such is not clear because what the examiner is interested to know about myelinated nerve is not defined considering certain aspects we can rule out this question the axons of the myelinated nerve will have a larger diameter hence option a is okay is not correct nerve impulses travels uniformly along the axolemma no it is not correct because in myelinated nerve it is a saltatory conduction jumping from one node of brain wear to another node of brain wear number option c density of voltage gated sodium channels are more this statement would be true if the myel it is at the internodal junctions that is in the myelinated nerve at the internodal junctions the density of voltage gated sodium channels are more and option d is sodium channels are less in axons for me option c appears most appropriately correct i am not most appropriately correct i say that option c may be the true answer so i have referenced here page 85 of the genong's textbook of physiology you can just see here the number of sodium channels per micrometer per square micrometer in mammalian neurons if you are looking at at the nodes of brain wear it is 2000 to 12000 on the soma it is 50 to 75 in the initial segment of the neuron 
that is wherever the neuron is, it is 350 to 500 channels. And on at the exon terminals, it is uh, 20 to 75. On the surface of the myelin, it is less than 25. So therefore, the most correct response may be density of voltage gated channels or more. Why I am telling maybe because the myelinated nerve, the stem should have been included the, the, at, the, at, the node of, at the node of Ranvier in the myelinated nerve. That should be the, or the stem should have been more specific. Going to the next question, question number two. The following vitamin is essential for oxidation of pyruvic acid and lactic acids in the neurons. It's a mostly a, a sort of a, a biochemistry question. However, I will try to answer, answer this question. So it is uh, vitamin B1, which is uh, essential for the oxidation of pyruvic acid to enter into the Krebs cycle. The vitamin B6, B12, and B2 are not involved in this type of activity. Now, to explain this thing, the following option, option A is correct, correct response. Now, I go back to here. This is uh, what I have taken from one of the journals because uh, I did not get the information from the, the Guyton or Genong or other textbook of uh, physiology. But uh, when I searched, this is one of the references I had taken, uh, Jester et al. Cancer and Metabolism. They mention, they look here, this is a lactate and pyruvate. These are interconvertible. And this pyruvate, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, pyruvate dehydrogenase. So this enzyme is activated by the presence of thymine pyrophosphate, thymine pyrophosphate. This is where it, it includes the pyruvate or it produces, or it, it oxidizes pyruvates and puts into the acetyl coenzyme A. Now, this lactate is interconvertible with the pyruvate depending upon the, uh, the substrate and the reactions. So now this lactate and pyruvate, they are involving or entering into the Krebs cycle for oxidation through this uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme which is activated by uh, thymine pyrophosphate. That is where the mechanism is. Okay, I, the option, hence the vitamin B1 is the correct response for question two. Now going to the question number three, lidocaine. Lidocaine, the options are K-channel blocker, Sodium potassium ATPase blocker, membrane toxin, sodium channel blocker. We consider here lidocaine is a local anesthetic. And this local anesthetic drugs, either lidocaine, procaine, lignocaine, or any of these drugs, they act on the sodium channels. Hence, option D, sodium channel blocker is correct. So it is not a potassium channel blocker. It is not a sodium potassium ATPase blocker, but sodium potassium ATPase blocker is a different compound and a membrane toxin like tetrodotoxin. It's not a membrane toxin. It is a sodium, local anesthetic sodium channel blocker. You can have this uh, uh, Genong's reference. You can find this thing on page 143 of the uh, Genong's 2010 edition. Question number four, in isometric contraction in skeletal muscle, option A, increase in muscle length, option B, increase in muscle tension, option C, external work is done, option D, decrease in muscle length. Please note, when a muscle contracts, there won't be increase in the muscle length. The either the muscle length remains the same or shortened. 
If the muscle length remains the same, it is isometric. If the muscle length becomes smaller or shortened, this is isotonic. So as it is isometric contraction, the increase in muscle length is not a correct response. Then the second response, the, the option C, external work is done. In case of the isometric contraction, the muscle length is not altered. Hence, muscle length is not altered. There is no work done. There is no definite work done. So that means option C is not correct. Then option D is a decrease in muscle length. In isometric contraction, the muscle length between the two ends do not alter. They remain constant. They remain constant. That is why it is called isometric. So now the option, that means when the muscle contracts, it contracts at the cost of, though the sarcomere length reduces, but it contracts at the cost of the series elastic component. Hence, it develops a tension, tension. So the option B is a correct response. This is the isometric uh, increase in the muscle tension. So increase in the muscle tension is the correct response. I've already explained the all, all other parameters. Now, question number five. A staircase phenomena is due to option A, tetanus, B, summation of contraction, C, progressively increased calcium available, availability in the sarcoplasm, increase D, increased troponin level in thin filaments. Please note that I have not changed the language and the content of the questions or the, the options. For that reason, there may be certain errors which I do not, I, though I may want it to change because I do not want to change because I'm discussing as they are, as they have appeared in the uh, paper. Here, staircase phenomena is a phenomena when a muscle is skeletal muscle or a cardiac muscle when they are stimulated at frequent intervals. So what happens, there would be the first, at a frequent intervals means it's not a continuous uh, titanizing pulses. That means at a very, not at a very higher frequency, at a lower frequency, at frequent intervals, so that the next contraction, next contraction, next contraction, they will increase in a stepwise manner, the staircase. So now this staircase is produced because of certain inherent things. The, the trepe is a German name for staircase. Okay, now come back. Since I have already mentioned it is a, a frequent stimulation, the, it, is not, it is not a frequent stimulation, it is the increased, increased frequency. Frequency means you are stimulating one after another at a frequency, at a greater frequency, not at a very titanizing frequencies. Titanizing frequencies may be uh, 50 hertz or even more. So in that, uh, there is a different uh, parameter. Now, it's not due to titanus. Titanus is a continuous, uh, the impulses, they are coming up and they are increasing the tension. It is not due to the summation of contraction. The summation of contraction happens because of uh, the elastic elements are taken or by the heat generation or by other purposes. There would be an additional uh, activity because already the series elastic component has been overtaken. The second impulse is coming. So that may produce that. So it is not due to the summation of contraction. It is not due to the change in the troponin level in thin filaments. So the answer is, it is a progressively increased calcium available in the sarcoplasm. Let us examine what happens. I have stimulated in the first contraction, there will be a release of N molecules of calcium to produce the excitation contraction coupling. And even before the relaxation, I give a second stimulus. What happened? Not all the N molecules of calcium, which are released into the sarcoplasm, are not put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
under such circumstances, some residual calcium remains in the sarcoplasm. Now you are giving a second stimulus. Again, the second stimulus is of a higher strength. That would again release the end moles of calcium. Now what happens? You have the residual calcium plus n moles of calcium. Now you have a more calcium availability, n plus R, I will say R1 because of the first stimulation. So that is more calcium available, more contraction. Then what happens in the second, third contraction? What happens? The num the, you will have again another set of residual calcium. Now I will say this residual calcium is R2. So now N plus R2, like that it goes on up to a certain level. The staircase comes to a level and it plateaus. So this is known as a trepe. So the answer C, option C, the progressively increased calcium available in the sarcoplasm is correct. So this is a correct response. And uh, you can see the reference in the Guyton and Hall on page 89. I'm trying to explain this thing. Okay, I have explained to a certain extent the details uh, you can read, read in this. Then moving on to question six. The question number six states that the Sertoli cells secrete testosterone, option A, option B is estrogen, Option C is endrostenodyne and option D is inhibin. If you are looking at the functions of the Sertoli cells, either in the intrauterine life or extrauterine life, so the, in the functions of the Sertoli, Sertoli cells in the intrauterine life, it is the Mullerian regression factor that is uh, one thing which uh, it, uh, it synthesizes or it secretes. Then after birth, so the Sertoli cells use testosterone secreted from leading cells because the testosterone is secreted by the leading cell. Use a testosterone from, secreted from the leading cells and they convert testosterone into estrogen. So that is one of the property of the Sertoli cells. They may secrete as estrogen. Okay, that's one. Okay, I will not say that a test, that means there is a, in this question, there is a conflict or there are two options correct. Okay, the second is it does not secrete endrosinodione. It does secrete inhibin because FSH acts on the FSH receptors located on the Sertoli cells and they will give a negative feedback to the pituitary through the inhibin. So inhibin is secreted. Now there are two options in the in this question. There are two options are correct. So estrogen is also correct because it secretes uh, uh, estrogen from the testosterone taken from the leading cells. Leading cells secrete testosterone and secretes estrogen. And here I have just uh, on page ten thirteen of the Guyton it is mentioned here. And on page 1022, they have mentioned about inhibin secretion. So in this paper or in this question, maybe Sertoli cells secrete estrogen may be correct or inhibin may be correct. Now it is, what, what is the key? I don't know. So now whatever may be the key, this is the uh, state of this uh, particular question. Okay, so now move on to the next question. Question number seven. The primordial follicle becomes primary follicle at. It's a sort of a, a memorizing question and uh, it's a, uh, there is no definitive timeline for any of the events in our biological system. Now, the conversion of the primordial follicles two primary follicle may happen in some days this side or that side. But anyway, considering that the question is the primordial follicle becomes primary follicle at option A, 28 weeks of gestation, option B, 21 weeks of gestation, 
Option C, 14 weeks of gestation. Option D is seven weeks of gestation. This is anybody's guess, but it has been stated that after five months, the primordial follicles change to primary follicle. I have referenced, I have found out because it is not easily, there is no clear cut uh, mention of the time of conversion, time of conversion of primordial follicle to primary follicle. So, but it is said that the primordial follicles become the or they will be there up to up to fifth month and after that they will change. It's vaguely mentioned either in the Guyton and Hall on uh, page uh, 20, 1027, page 1027, or in a Burn and Levy, chapter 43, sixth edition, chapter 43. These are the references I have. I worked very hard to get the answers for these things. So now if it is fifth month, then the answer is, it is option B, 21st week, weeks of the station. Fifth month means five into four, 20. That means 21st week is the nearest. So 21st weeks of the station. If that is the thing, that's the correct response. Okay, so 28 weeks is not correct. 14 and seven are not correct. Okay, moving on, because I have already given the reference for this particular thing. It's a, it's a sort of a memorizing, no, do not have a uh, memorizing thing and uh, uh, the only thing uh, is a particular thing and it's uh, in none of the Genong and Gaitan, they will not say precisely, they will say that the primordial follicles are converted into a, a primary follicle. So then we will say question, we will go to question number eight. Uh, main hormone of luteal phase is one, A, estrogen, B, progesterone, C, prolactin, D, oxytocin. It's a very simple, straightforward question. The lute, carpus luteum mainly secretes progesterone. So option B is correct response. You can just see that option B, progesterone is the correct response. You can see, I have just pasted that picture. You can just see that this is the this is the ovulation, this is the luteal phase. In this luteal phase, you have this blue curve or the blue lines. This is the progesterone. So you can, I have just referenced in my guidance books, 1029. It is there in all the textbooks of physiology, uh, even in the Genong is also, it is there. So I, I did not bother to put that uh, in this uh, particular thing because it's not a controversial uh, question. Question number nine. Progesterone mainly causes the development of which component of the breast? In the mammary gland development, this is the question. Progesterone mainly causes the development of which component of the breast? Option A, duct system. Option B, lobuloalveolar system. Option D, the ranchyma of the breast. Or option D, myoepithelial cells. Look here, duct system is developed by the estrogen. The parenchyma of the breast is by the prolactin, growth hormone, insulin, thyroxine, all other hormones, all other tropic or a growth promoting hormones. Myoepithelial cells of the breast are under the governance of oxytocin. Now, the progesterone at the at every month, the progesterone increases the lobulo alveolar growth. So the option B is correct. So the progesterone mainly causes the development of which component of the breast? The option B, lobulo alveolar system, is correct. And uh, I have referenced uh, this thing uh, uh, 1057 of the Guyton and Hall. Okay, that's there in, in, uh, in even in, you can also find it in the Genong text. You can just go and find it out. Okay, move on to the next question. Which of the contraceptive method for a lady? 
before first child birth, which is the best contraceptive method for lady before first child birth. So you may not find the answers very straightforward from, in, from the textbook of uh, physiology. Anyway, I will discuss them here. So option A, OCP. OCP is a oral contraceptive pills. Option B, IUD. IUD is intrauterine device. Option C is tubectomy. It is a surgical procedure. Option D is a diaphragm. So now, because this lady, even before the childbirth, would like to have a contraceptive or would like to use the contraceptive method. In this, tubectomy is out of question. It is a surgical procedure wherein it permanently produces the contraception. So tubectomy option C is out of question. So intrauterine devices are indicated for a lady after giving a first child birth for spacing purposes. So that means option B, option B is also not suitable answer for this question. That is the after, before first child birth. It would be okay after first child birth. Because for spacing between the pregnant, between the pregnancies during the lactation time, they do not, uh, or uh, the second pregnancy, so do not have immediately after the first. So their spacing is used by the intrauterine device. Now we are left with the oral contraceptive pills and diaphragm. So now the oral contraceptive pills produce a, a temporary things and they produce, a, uh, they are good contraceptive procedures or methods used. And that is one aspect. The diaphragms can also be used, but the diaphragms have a greater failure rate and they may produce pelvic infection and the pelvic infection may lead to certain other complications. So for that reason, option A appears a correct response. So that means uh, the, the answer to this question is uh, option A, OCP, oral contraceptive pills. Move on to the, I have not referenced to any, any of the books here because uh, uh, these, these are not mentioned in the uh, textbooks of uh, physiology as I am trying to uh, describe you. Maybe your um, community medicine or even your uh, obstetric and gynecology department, they would be able to tell you more when you go to the clinical site. Now, moving on to Question number 11, I would again request all of you to subscribe to my channel and leave your comments and uh, for any discussion, okay. The question number 11, scavenger cells in the brain, option A, astrocyte, option B, oligodendrocyte, option C, Golgi cells, option D, microglia. Answer is straightforward answer, clear. Oligodendrocytes are for myelin. The Golgi cells are neurons. Astrocytes are there in the, they are there, they are doing the housekeeping business, but the microglia or the tissue, they are the modified macrophages, macrophages present in the, the brain cells. So the microglia option D is the correct response. So microglia option D is the correct response. They are the scavenger cells of the brain. So now I have referenced here page 83. You can find it out in the Genomics Review of Medical Physiology. Now moving on to question number 12. The inhibitory neurotransmitter in central nervous system neurons is very simple, straightforward 
appears straightforward question. The option A is glutamate. Glutamate, option B is aspartate. Option C is a gamma amino butyric acid and option D is taurine. Look here, glutamate and aspartate, that is option A and B, these are excitatory amino acids. They produce excitation, excitation. that means it's not, they are not inhibitory. The gamma amino butyric acid is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. That is uh, option C, that is the correct response. However, a taurine, taurine stimulates the GABA release in certain nervous system. So that means a taurine may produce or stimulate the GABA release and may produce the inhibition. This question again is tricky, but considering the various textbook description, gamma inhibitory acid, option C is the correct response. Option C is the correct response. Now, question number 13. The action potential from receptor is generated at option A, lamella at nerve ending, option B, nerve ending, option C, first node of Ranvia, option D, cells attached to nerve ending. See, the action potential is not generated in the lamella of the nerve ending. Okay, that's, that means it's not correct. The nerve ending, nerve ending is because it is not there, receptor is here and the nerve ending in the other side. So it is not a response. Option B is not a response. So then it is cells attached to the nerve ending. So the nerve, again, it is going to the nerve ending and any other cell or the muscle attached to the nerve ending. Okay, how does it matter to us? So now this is option D is not correct. It is first mode of NVR. First, the action potential is generated from the generator potential created by these cells or the receptors and it would appear in the first mode of NVR. I will just show you here, in the, that means option C is correct response. You can just see here, this is where the generation, this is deformed area and the receptor potential or generator potential is generated. And at this, the first node of RNVR, this is, this is generated here and that would create the action potential here from this, this one and subsequently. So that means it is generated here in the first of all plan we are. And this is, I have taken it from uh, Guyton and Hall. And you will find this reference or this is a reference in the Genox textbook course, page number 589. Okay, uh, move on to the next question. Question number 14, which of the following sensation is not carried in the dorsal column pathway? Option A, vibration. Option B, stereognosis. Option C, crude touch. And option D, proprioception. Which of the following sensation is not carried? So that means the vibration is carried by the dorsal column pathway. <coughs> the stereognosis. <coughs> Stereognosis is by the dorsal column pathway. Proprioception by the dorsal column pathway. So the option C, crude touch is the correct response. Crude touch is not carried by the dorsal column. The, the correct response is crude touch option C. This is a simple straightforward uh, question. Now, question number 15. Okay, question number 15. Which of the following is true about visceral pain? So, A, it is poorly localized. B, resembles fast pain produced by noxious stimulation of the skin. C, mediated by B fibers in the dorsal roots in the spinal nerves. D causes the relaxation of nearby skeletal muscles. 
So now let us discuss the visceral pain is not a fast pain. It is a slow, dull, aching pain and uh, discomfort produced by the viscera or a distension of the viscera. It is not the fast pain. The option B is not correct. And if you are looking at the B fibers, B fibers are the preganglionic fibers of the autonomic nervous system, the preganglionic fibers. And uh, so the, the about the preganglionic fibers, that means that they are not carried by the, they are not carried by the uh, B fibers because even before the B fibers, they are carried. So that means the postganglionic fibers carry the information. So this is also not a correct response. Now, what happens when there is a visceral pain, there is a guarding of the muscle, the muscle contraction takes place. If you are looking at here, cause is a relaxation of a nearby skeletal muscles. No, it's not a correct response. It will produce the contraction of the, the corresponding uh, skeletal muscles to have the guarding. Suppose if there is a abdominal viscera or something is there, a visceral pain is there, abdominal guarding is there, contraction of the abdominal wall muscle takes place. So that means option B, C, D are not true, are not correct. So, but the visceral pain is a vague pain and it is not localized precisely. It will be, the patient will tell here, there, everywhere. So it is poorly localized. Option A is a correct response. It is poorly localized. I have given you the reference here, the page 619 of Guy General Hall. I have discussed all the all the other options. Question number 16. But this question is uh, having typo error, I guess, because the units used in the options are not appropriate. One, let, let me discuss the question here. The diameter of the Golgi tendon organ, diameter of the Golgi tendon organ is 100 millimeters, 150 millimeters, 50 millimeters, 200 millimeters. Can you imagine 200 millimeters means 20 centimeters. Golgi tendon organ will be that big, 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters. 15 centimeters or 5 centimeters. So the options given for the answers are not correct. Hence, this question uh, do not have the, there is a, some error, typo, maybe typo error. That is what I, I, I guess. So it should be micrometers. It should be micrometers. If in that case, we may find an answer. Let us see this question. If you are looking at the options, I just searched in the Genong and Gaitan and even other textbooks of physiology. Uh, I could not get the description of the size or the diameter of the, the Golgi tendon organ. The Golgi tendon organ is necessary for the universal stretch response. Whenever the muscle tension is too high, it protects the muscle to be muscle uh, not to, to be ruptured. It prevents excessive contraction of the muscle. So now, the size is not mentioned in these books. However, in a Candle's textbook of neuroscience, they mention it, the Golgi tendon organs are a slender, encapsulated structures, approximately one millimeter long and point one millimeter in diameter. You got the point here. Yeah. 0.1 millimeter. So if it is 100 micrometer, and this would be the correct response. Located at the junction between the skeletal muscle fibers and a tendon. Each capsule encloses a several braided collagen fibers connected to series of group of muscle fibers. These are flower spray endings. Flower spray endings, just like a spray. The paint the spray is made, you know, flower spray endings. We're extending it for a large area. 100 micron uh, is not a small area. It's a large area and uh, it's not a millimeter. Units used are not correct. So this question uh, requires to be upgraded. 
So now I have taken this uh, particular uh, reference from the uh, principles of neuroscience from Kendall and uh, Eric Kendall and uh, et al. On page 800, it is mentioned. It is a fifth edition, 2013 edition. <laughs> Move on to the question number 17. This is another controversial question. Striatonigral projection degeneration of this pathway produces. I read again. Striatonigral projection degeneration of this pathway produces A. Parkinsonism, B. Huntington disease, C. Bellism, D. Hemibellism. Uh, I was uh, trying to look into the many of the textbooks, many, many textbooks. I think I, I must have searched uh, more than uh, six or seven textbooks and even I searched the Harrison. So now in these textbooks, the, it is a nigrostriatal projection, the substantia nigra, substantia nigra, loses the dopaminergic neurons. That means a nigrostriatal projection is affected. That is how we teach to the undergraduate students, the first MBBS student, the lesions in the nigrostriatal tract uh, produces uh, the Parkinson's. Now, if you are reversing striatonigral projection, yes, there are striatonigral projections. These striatonigral projections are gabargic. I know more about that. But uh, here the question is striatonigral projections going to the substantia nigra, what they produce? However, uh, there is not clear. When I searched, it is not available in the textbooks of physiology. The answer to this question is not available in the textbook of physiology. Anyway, so now when I searched in the, I, when I Googled it, the striatonigral lesions produces a peculiar disease known as a multiple system atrophy. Multiple system atrophy. Now this multiple system atrophy includes lesions of the, the substantia nigra, the striatum, and even some parts of the pontopeduncular nucleus, where cerebellar inputs are also coming. So that means the multiple system atrophy, it has a two component, one Parkinsonism component and a cerebellar component. They are described as the MSAP if it is uh, manifesting with the Parkinson-like uh, symptoms or if it is uh, manifesting like a cerebellar disease, it is mentioned as MSAC. So the answer to this question, I, I, cannot, I cannot provide you clearly with this type of uh, availability because uh, looking at the textbooks of physiology, it is the nigrostriatal tract that produces the Parkinson's. You can just see that Parkinsonism, nigrostriatal tract. It's a clear. Huntington disease, it's the striatopelidal pathway. Striatopelidal pathway. Bellism is the lesion in the subthalamic nucleus. Bellism and hemibellism, bellismus, they are almost one is a uh, less severe and one is a more severe total, total bellismus or uh, less hemibellismus is a uh, one side. So they are subthalamic nucleus. They are in part. So now I leave it to you, and uh, maybe what you have answered, and what the university has given the uh, key for this answer, I don't know. I, I have discussed about what is the situation. Question number eighteen: Slow wave sleep associated with. Maybe I mean I would again like to read it as a slow wave sleep is associated with because this is how the the question paper has come. 
Slow wave sleep associated with option A, dreams, option B, cardiac arrhythmia, option C, penile intumescence, option D, delta activity. Slow wave sleep, what happens? The dreams are usually seen in the REM sleep. That is a slow wave sleep is a NREM sleep. And you will see the, the, the cardiac irregularities and other things may be, may not be here, may not be in the slow waves. And even penile intermissions is not seen. So that means option A, B, C are not correct. So, but the slow wave sleep is named because they have a very large and slow waves in the EEG. Large and slow waves in the EEG. These waves are these waves are called delta waves. They have a frequency even between one to three hertz or even less. Very very slow waves. So these are this is a delta activity is the correct response. So now I have given the I have given the reference here. Delta activity is the that means option D is the correct response. And I have given the reference here, uh, page number 754 of the Guy Channel Hall. Move on to the next question, question number 19. The total refractive power of the eye is 60D, which is contributed by. The total refractive power of I is 60D, which is contributed by. Option A, 43D by lens and 17D by cornea. D stands here for diopters. Option A, 43D by lens and 17D by cornea. The maximum diopteric power of the eye is in the cornea. The lens provides only about 17 to 20 diopters. So now let us look at that option A is 43D and 17D cornea. Option B is a 30D by lens, 30D by cornea is not correct. Option C, 23D by lens and 37D by cornea is not correct. And uh, option D is a correct response, 17D by lens and 43D by cornea. Though this thing is not clearly mentioned in the textbooks of physiology, but I am mentioning you here. So this is a, a two, -third, two third of 60. So the, the guidance textbook of physiology mentions that the two third of the total dietric power is by the cardiac. Now, if you are looking two third of 60, it is 40 diopters. So now, if you are looking at the 40 diopters and 43 is uh, the 40 diopters. So that means option D is the correct response. There are no clear cut uh, uh, mention of the 17D, 43D or something like that. You may require uh, um, a specific ophthalmology books. However, I will take it that the, the large or the greatest Refraction happens at cornea, then the lens is only contributing to one third of the total refractory power. Question number 20. This is again a very rare a question, or is not, is a question which has uh, its own uh, implications. Now, first, let me read about the question, then I will talk or comment on this question. Hemineglect occurs in lesions of option A, temporal lobe, option B, prefrontal lobe, option C, parietal lobe, option D, frontal lobe. I searched the books, the Guyton and Hall, Genong, there is no word about hemineglect. However, in Genong are in Guyton and Hall on page 23. 
there is what is called a personal neg neglect. When he is trying to describe about the basal ganglia, there is a term known as a personal neglect. So that means one half of the body is not able to identify or mention. And this personal neglect, so it's, there is no mention of hemineglect. The personal neglect is because of the lesions in the parietal lobe. So the answer to the hemineglect, I searched in a Candles neuroscience book, and it is mentioned on page 1555. Again, the things are not clear. So now, hemineglect is a, a very distinct phenomena or distinct entity of the nervous system. And it, it is a less taught to the students of physiology because I, I, I should submit, I should confess, I would have not uh, uh, talked to my students anywhere. So with this, uh, this thing, anyway, personal neglect, it is there in the item I had mentioned about. And uh, now, the, that is the, maybe parietal load is the correct response. Uh, friends, I have discussed all the questions. Thank you. Okay, so now I would uh, request you to subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments in the box and mention any topic or question to be discussed in the comment box so that I will take it up for your benefit. Thank you once again.